Hey everyone, welcome Ampeg friends from around the world. Dom, my co-host is here, Dom Liberati. My name is Dino Monoxilis. You are live, we're, we're live actually uh, on SVT time. Dom, this is episode number 10. Can you Cheers believe it? number 10. I can't believe they keep letting us do this. Uh, right? Hey, what you got in the cup there? Oh, it's definitely coffee, don't worry. Yeah, right. <laughs> Anyways, um, this is a very special edition of SVT Time. We're doing it for the NAM Believe in Music. Uh, as as we all know, uh, everybody welcome. Uh, Tom, we got a, as we say here in Boston, we got a wicked special SVT killer. for you. A killer show. <laughs> we got Porter Flex. <laughs> so not only do we, we not only have one artist, two artists, or three artists, we actually have four artists joining us today. So without further ado, I'll bring them all in. Uh, let's first uh, intro Eva Gardner is with us today. Uh, welcome, Eva. Thanks. Uh, John Button is with us. Uh, Jeff Kilson is also with us, joining us today. Okay. And, hey, Jeff. Hey. And, and Hutch yeah. is with us too, Hutch Hutchinson. So... What's up, Hutch? Welcome, everyone. Hey Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> oh, nice. All right. All right. <laughs> Who brought the bass to the party? <laughs> <laughs> I, have, there, I, was, I was playing along with the theme, you know, the catchy theme. So, you know, I figured just keep it on. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm, go I'm going to toot my own he horn here for a second. That was me and a guitar player that we recorded years ago. I kind of thought that. Yeah, I did a little <laughs> Played a lot right back then. In a good way. Anyway, <laughs> that's great. Great I just caught that. Thanks, Jeff. I'm like, oh. well, no, gee, good. who should we get to do the theme? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, so anyway, welcome everyone for uh, for coming. We are, like I said, we're live at um, in the absence of us all actually being able to get together at Nam and hang out. And that's always the fun part of Nam is is the relationships and. You know, gear is there and the business is there, but it's it's really just hanging out with everybody and having conversations and and talking about stuff. So, uh, in absence of that, obviously we're we're doing this this way. We're we're streaming live, and uh, just wanted to catch up with you all and, and see how everybody's doing. How's everybody faring through all of this? All right. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, what's that? Hanging in there. Good. Good. Oh, hang on a second here. I am. Something just happened with my screen here. Uh oh, here, don't worry. And this is really. Yeah, I'm fine today. Ironically, with all the virtual NAM, we still have as much, if not more, hand sanitizer. It's ironic. <laughs> well, I was going to say maybe Hutch, you could just do a whole bunch of really loud slap licks that we try and hear. There we go. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It some for some reason my screen just like got really large and I can only like see some of these, but we'll deal with it. Really? Yeah, yeah. I wish mine could get really large. Oh, Kira, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. You're gonna have to get a base cam there, Hutch. You know, so we, we need to see the base. Too. Oh god, what a good idea. I think I'm gonna invest in one here coming up. It's my it's my birthday this week too, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> So actually, I, I'm, so Jeff, your birthday was this past week. It was indeed. It was on Tuesday. So happy birthday! Thank you. Happy birthday to you. And Hutch's birthday is actually tomorrow. No, it's actually Sunday, Dino. But thanks for remembering. <laughs> <laughs> Today's not Saturday. I thought today was Saturday. You usually take me out for drinks at Nam, and I I have a hard time recovering at this point in my life. So. Um. <laughs> That's what happens when you turn 29, Hutch. Exactly. Thanks. Uh, 29 and holding, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> My first record deal. <laughs> when you were 29. No, uh, at, 
18 actually. I was going to say you were a lot yeah. you were a lot younger than that, weren't you when you completely, got Completely, yeah, with with Clive with Columbia, yeah, okay. in, in the Bay Area. Okay. So. Now, obviously we'll, we'll we're going to we're going to cover everybody's beginnings here, but I'll start with you Hutch. So, you you started with a band, if, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Copperhead? Sort of. I started playing in Boston when I was a teenager and I was in a band. We won the WBCN Battle of the Band. So in uh-oh, it's only me now. Where'd you guys go? Just you. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anyway, I was 14, and we won a Battle of the Bands for WBCN Radio. And uh, my old friend Jeff Skunk Baxter took the band in the studio, and that's really when I, I cut my first record. So it was about, it was about, not, it was about 1966, maybe. And it was Whoa. on an Ampex 3 track. That's how old it was. Mm, wow. And, um, yeah, exactly. I'd love to have that now, actually. But uh, yeah. Yeah, left, right, and center channel. Oh, man. And, I think it's uh, amazing. They were amazing machines, yeah. Really? I mean, it was – and then basically through the late 60s, I watched it go from a, that 3 track to a 4 track in 66, 67, to the um, to, uh, first 8 track I saw was in New York. And then the in 1970, I was in the Bay Area, and I remember when they brought in the first MCI 16 track machines into Wally Hyders. So, wow. which is also where I at Winterland, where I saw my first wedges on a stage. Before that, it was pretty much primitive, and you had yeah, yeah exactly side fill everywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was uh, an incredible time. But anyway, I started out there. The band I was in, in at that period, we we got to open for the Yardbirds and for Vanilla Fudge. Props yep. to Tim and yep. uh, Carmine, and um, we opened for a bunch of different. We opened for Moby Grape, and it was sort of like between that and seeing the other bands, making friends with John Entwistle, and you know, uh, and a number of other people who I met in my teen years. I mean, it sort of sealed the deal, and I, I wanted to move on, and I wanted to make records, so I basically I went to Berkeley for a moment, and then I headed west and. Luckily enough, I ended up with some great Latin. I worked with some great Latin musicians in, in the Mission District and in Oakland. Played some funk and some Latin stuff. Coke Escovito and uh, his brothers. And um, and uh, then I ended up in the Bay in Marin and playing with Mickey Hart and uh, John Cipollina. And that led to the gig in Cophead. So that was mm. sort of I got into the, the Bay Area jam band scene early on. And uh, I left there in 74. I went to, um, I moved to Latin America and I started working with a producer, uh, Bob Porter, whose son is Casey Porter, who's one of the most illustrious producers in our time of Latin music, uh, Santana and worked the Estefans and everyone else. And uh, anyway, so that's uh, pretty much after that, I ended up in Texas and then I joined the Neville Brothers when I was 24 in New Orleans. And uh and that sort of put me on the map. I mean, I was, uh, I was, I stood out in that band and it was a great learning experience. And through them, I ended up working with Alan Toussaint and Dr. John. And, and I, that's where I met the Stones. We opened the tours in 78 and 81. And of course I worked with them in the studio a fair amount and still maintain a relationship. And then uh, through Ian McGlagan and Ronnie Wood, who were of course in the faces, who were with the Stones at that point? I met Bonnie Wright in New Orleans in '83, um, and I've been with her ever since. Wow. So, and that led to, of course, my working with Don Waz and a number of other producers in the UK and uh, in LA. So, basically, I played on 100 records for Don, maybe, and uh, a number of other people. Yeah. That's so, incredible. and here we are today. And here we so, are today. Here. <laughs> any uh, any good end whistle stories? Hmm. I have too many end whistle stories, but we need to talk about that some other time. Yeah. John and I, John, John, just before he passed, Pino's one of my dearest friends too. And we're sort of contemporaries more so. And, uh, but I met John at the Boston tea party in 1968 and he sort of took me under his wing. I mean, I spent many a night with him up in Stowe and, and uh, a couple of his last gigs in the UK in 2001, I was there with Keltner doing a David Halliday record at, um, at a studio in Chiswick, uh, power, it's like a huge old power station. And um, anyway, John, we were staying at the Landmark and uh, Hotel and I ran into John and Cy Langston and 
they with a couple of ex-girlfriends ended up taking me out for my 50th birthday. And that was, that was quite a night. It's uh, sort of unforgettable, but he was gone six months after that. So yeah, he called me a few days before he'd passed uh, to we used to go to a place with Rick Rosas, Rick, the bass player. Uh, we used to go to a little sushi bar in studio city called us and uh, sort of a hang for musicians. And uh, so John would go there every Monday or Tuesday and we'd all, so he called me that week and uh, I was out on the road with Bonnie and um, I got home on Wednesday, which is the night he passed away, I believe in Vegas. Um, They were supposed to play, I think Friday night and and open the tour in Vegas. And um, I walked into a record store in Sherman Oaks and they said, oh, too bad about your friend. And I went, oh, who was that? And, you know, the last person I thought was John because I'd spoken to him two or three days prior. So um, it was like it was a tough way to find out. But then I got home, my phone rang and it was Pino going, oh, man, I can't believe this. I'm scared to death. (laughs) I was supposed to leave L.A. to go on holiday and Pino convinced me to stay for the show because he needed some moral support. So, um, and now we have John. Yeah. He's over here in the corner. Full circle. The, the, but, um, the, and there is a perfect segue. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> I know my segues, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm not worthy. No, you are worthy, believe me. Man. So, so John, tell us about, tell us a little about your beginnings and how you ended up with, you know, one of the, like, most amazing bass chairs in the world. <laughs> Well, I applied to the Make a Wish Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's like? Um, oh, beginnings. I uh, let's see. Wow. Um, I started. My, so my oldest brother is a drummer, and he's ten years older than me. And he, when he was seventeen, bought a bass, and I was about seven. And bless his heart, he used to let me mess around with it. And I, I actually started piano at four. I grew up in a musical family. So all my, I had four, four older siblings that all played music and my parents play. And so, um, yeah, I knew I wanted to do music. And so this bass was laying around this beautiful Rickenbacker, which shoot, I should, it's sitting right over there. I should grab it. Wow. Um, in a minute. Uh, but you know, my brother had that laying around and, uh, he bless his heart. Let me fill around on that. And I started, I really enjoyed it. Um, and my brilliant mom uh, suggested I join the school orchestra um, mm. in third grade. So I started playing in the orchestra, reading music, and taking uh, private lessons uh, on classical upright bass. Playing double bass. Correct. Um, and, uh, you know, it's funny. So I grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, and there wasn't that I found much of like a – band like join a band and play in a band scene but there was a really really good well-funded uh music in the schools program okay so hence i had orchestra in third grade with an amazing teacher um i had jazz band in uh junior high and high school and did all that kind of so all that scholastic stuff playing in jazz band and orchestras and that's what i grew up doing okay Um, and then went to University of North Texas and studied jazz performance, played in the crazy jazz bands there, which nice. are well known. Great school. Were you were a part of the one o'clock band? I was in the one o'clock band, wow. believe it or not. I listened to, the, you know, they make a record every yeah. year in that band. I listened back to that and go, oh my God, was that me? Did I actually do that? Like, do, 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 do. Right? right? <laughs> I can't do that anymore. Um, and do, you then, know, do you know Dean Parks? Of course, yeah. You know, there's because he's he has some stories. He was actually a horn player in the band. You know, he played saxophone in the water. Play, 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 I was doing a gig with him at the write off room a couple of years ago, a regular thing, and he'd switch between pedal steel and sax, which most people aren't are, aren't even aware he plays. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. No, not at all. Yeah, so he played saxophone in the one o'clock band, and now he's like a big. Session player has been for years, obviously. He's great. Um, yeah. like Best cat. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when I finished school in Texas, I moved straight out to LA. I decided I, I, I had sort of, as a kid, sort of thought, you know, I kind of want to be a session guy in LA. Um, that was sort of what I always had my eyes on. So I came out here and um, 
you know, tried to play with, I knew when I moved out here, I knew like two people. Mm -hmm. So that was helpful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now you know six people. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Five actually. So, and I would just play with anyone who would have me. And, you know, just one thing led to another, um, which ended up, I ended up uh, auditioning for Roger Daltrey's band about 10 years ago. He had a solo project. He was doing a solo tour. Um, and I played with him for a long time. And then uh, somewhere along the line, uh, Pino was not going to be doing The Who anymore. Um, and Roger said, hey, get my guy that plays in my solo band. Yeah. And then uh, we rehearsed for about 10 minutes and then recorded a DVD <laughs> and roll out the wall. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. right. And you get to play with Zach. <laughs> yes, Zach is... He's the best. He's so, great. So fun to play with. He's so just, you never know what he's going to do. He's, you know, he's just off the, you know, flying by the seat of your pants. Just And he's a horrible cat, you know. I mean. Yeah. So. Is that, is that awesome. Zach Starkey? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. His dad played in some band. Yeah, what was it? Uh, and his mentor, his mentor, I think Keith actually, Mooney actually gave him his first kit, you know. That's right. Uh, yeah. And he was a, uh, Entwistle was a very, very dear friend dear friend and kind of they spent a lot of time together okay yeah for sure mm. so let's move uh jeff tell us so obviously you know you're I, I, correct me if i'm wrong but you're you're like entrance into the scene was with docking docking right Back. yeah i mean I, I did stuff before that but yeah that was the first thing i did that got any prominence i guess um yeah. and that was 1983 um you know like these guys i learned a bit in school myself i started cello in fifth grade um and then went moved to string bass when i was a senior in high school and I actually went to the university of washington for a minute as a string bass major haven't nice. really played much since since then so i'm more than rusty uh but i did mm -hmm. love it at the time um and then yeah i uh joined docking in 83 uh went with that till 89 um then we broke up the first time uh had a couple of my own bands uh played with uh Dio in 93 for nice. a couple of years, which was a wonderful time. Doc and got back together in the mid 90s, and I stayed with that till about 2000. Uh, then, in um, uh, then about 2004, I got a call from Jason Bonham, who was playing with Mick Jones, and uh, he wanted to know if I'd be interested in playing. They weren't really sure what they were going to do yet. Um, Jason ended up kind of talking him into revamping Foreigner, which was a good idea. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I started playing with them in 2004. I've been there ever since. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, and I will say this. I've seen Foreigner a couple of times. I think the last time I saw you guys was at the Black Hills Rally for Sturgis. And mm -hmm. if, if if anybody watching has never seen a Foreigner show, I will, I will say this. What's your set? An hour and a half? Maybe two yeah. hours? Sometimes a little longer. Yeah, it depends. I promise anybody that's watching this, every single song that they play for two hours is a number one hit. Yeah. Maybe, well, not, not, number one. One. Maybe not a number one, but it's like when it, when you start playing, it's like, oh, my God, I remember that song. Oh, like song after song yeah. after song. And yeah, we had 30, 30 top 30, 30 top 30 songs. So, wow. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. That list is cheating. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, last but not least, we say I, we saved the best for last, Eva. Oh, shots! <laughs> really the cutest. <laughs> and the, and the cutest. Okay, so tell tell us your story. Yeah, well, I mean, I grew up in the music mix, really. Uh, I mean, Hutch will attest to the family that I grew up in. Um, I grew up with a lot of the same folks. Like my dad was uh, a bass player, and uh, so I grew and up around. Friend. Yeah, and um, he uh, was part of the British invasion of the 60s and shared the bill with The Who in the early days. Um, you know, he started playing in the early 60s and he was in his first band with Ron Wood because they lived in the same neighborhood, um, the British Birds. And that was just the scene that back then, you know, they all um, were, uh, he did a tour, he was in the creation and he opened up for the Rolling Stones in 1967. It was Brian Jones's last tour with them. I mean, it's just really epic, epic stuff. And 
he moved out to LA and um, his band was signed to Capitol and stayed in LA. And um, I actually met my mom in New Orleans and that's how Hutch, yeah, I mean, you know, all the same, all the same folks and uh, ended up in LA and, and had me four years later. So I just grew up and he also opened up a British pub in Hollywood called the Cat and Fiddle. So that was just a hub of music, entertainment. And so I just grew up hearing about all these stories and the uh, just all the adventures on the road. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do as well. And uh, sure enough, I started playing bass when I was uh, about 14, uh, much to the dismay of my father. He wasn't really into the idea, interestingly. <laughs> um, but it was it was like specifically like I remember John Entwistle was was a very encouraging force in, in my early days. And, and Andy Johns gave me my first bass lesson. That's and right. it was like it was like his, his his buddies that were the ones that were like, come on, kid, I know you, you know. Um, that encouraged me to do it. And um, I mean, we used to stay at John Entwistle's house and when we go to England and uh, he, he let me um, know Morton on the Marsh. Oh, okay, yeah. Stayed and, there too, yeah. And he just like, I remember he's like, I hear you're, you're, you're learning how to play bass. And he just opened up this closet. Yeah, it was like a hallway. Hutch, I'm sure he showed it to you. It was just a hallway full of just instruments, we, just basses as far as the eye spent many, many a long night in that hallway. Yes. Okay. Very, yeah. very long nights. Yeah. And it's just, like Narnia. I'd say, oh exactly. my God, I saw you play this bass in the Lake Placid Blue P bass, which I own now yep. actually. Yep. And uh, really? Really? you know, I mean, it's, it, that was such, I, I mean, you could go down the hallway and see different periods in his career because these instruments were so identifiable. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was going to say something when when you were like an infant, I believe your father would we'd come home from somewhere and we'd go in the, and I'd be going, I don't want to wake the kids. And they'd, oh, no, man, go, don't worry about that. You know, and everybody, <laughs> and that was you. And I was thinking about that earlier the other day, you know, because it was such an, an active, your father, your father was such a great player and he was such and he was into jazz as well. He just wasn't a yeah. rock player. And yeah. um and it was, it, he was just such a vibrant personality and a great musician. He loved music so much and he would talk about it. And I used to play with Ivan Neville and, you know, at the fiddle on New Year's Eve on a regular basis. I like have photos of you guys. I'm sure you do. And I'm sure some of them of me aren't very flattering at this point, but, <laughs> but they were, uh, they were special times. And uh, uh, for you to grow up in that, around that scene with, these great, great musicians and great people. It's it's so great. He'd be so proud of you today and your accomplishments. And, Thank you. And your yeah. playing and everything else. So, the the hey. magic was contagious. Oh my and, God. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. I feel that way. I feel that way about it. Now, Thank you. Now yeah. you, you still have some of some of your dad's gear too, right? Yeah, and it's and it's funny because like he would never let me touch his stuff when I was a kid. You know, like his '62 <laughs> Fiesta Red Precision, like Beautiful. you know. We weren't even like barely even allowed in his studio, you know, like don't touch my shit, kid. And, uh, <laughs> and, yeah. And uh and so now, God bless him, you know, I, I've inherited um all of those incredible instruments and his old uh Portaflex, you know, and and yeah. um and so I'm I'm very lucky that I got all you know, all his magical gear. Yeah. Um and also his love for music, you know. I I just really I'm just so grateful that I had that upbringing because when I was a kid, I thought it was normal, right? Like this is just, you know, you never, you know, oh, you never knew when I was getting up for school in my little Catholic school uniform, you never knew who would be in our living room still up playing guitar, you know, with my yeah. dad, like just like cigarette smoke and beer and, you know, just, just the stench of smoke and alcohol. And that was just my life. You know, that was it, was, it was a very English rock thing though, wasn't it? It was in yeah. LA. It was yeah. totally, uh, you, know, you know, your dad was like the ambassador, you know, he, he was in LA. He totally was, you know? especially and, with the, the pub, you know, it was and like then your mom, it was for me, the best of both worlds growing up in new England, growing up in Boston, being inundated with British rock bands when I was a kid and then having family in new Orleans and being a part of that music scene pretty intensely for many years. I mean, you guys were the perfect family for me. I mean, it was like when I when I was in LA, I thought it was just so so ideal. The cat 
was such a great place for so many years uh, for for English musicians and New Orleans musicians because of your mom. So yeah, yeah. it was so did, cool and welcoming. Did you say your dad started the cat and fiddle? He did. Wow. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> we, got two, we got two stools from the cat and fiddle when they had that. <laughs> oh, and so, so yeah. I, I want to hear that story. <laughs> I, got to, I got to tell you, when I was a student at MI, I I don't know how many Fridays and Saturdays I would stumble out of the cat and fiddle, obviously. And I remember the first time I met Eva, we were talking. I was like, well, you must have worked there at that time when I was, you know, when I was going to school and going in there. And, and she was like, I remember you saying, well, when was that? I said, well, that was like 91, 92. She was like, yeah, Dean, I I, I was in elementary school. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I really feel old now. Right Thanks. across the street. Our elementary school was right across the street. It was that big that big church oh, wow. uh, yeah. across the way. So we just walk across the street when my sisters and I were done with school in our little uniforms and do our homework in the back room. Whoa. And like literally grew up in a pub, you know, and as soon as we were old <laughs> enough to be put on payroll, which is 16 in the state of California, uh, right. We all behave, you know, I started out as a hostess and then worked in the office. By 21, I was slinging drinks behind the bar. And then uh, when I started touring, um, you know, I would work behind the bar, but in between gigs. What? And it was just, yeah. yeah. It truly is legendary. I came from like middle of Ohio, knew nobody out here. And I knew within the first month, word of mouth, that that was the place to hang mm -hmm. for musicians. This is insane. Yeah. And it's funny. My mom said, uh, as she, part of the reason why they opened the cat was to get the party out of the living room. <laughs> Genius. Cause like we, me and my sisters came along, you know, my parents had kid, kids now. So I was like, all right, Kim, get the party out of the living room. So it was his, his start, other. Start monetizing the hangs, you know? It, it, yeah. That too. <laughs> Monetize <laughs> why not? Good book yeah. title. And he was, the, he was the host with the most. So he, he loved it. It was, uh, it was, and and it, it brought it's brought a lot of joy to people all over the world. So, yeah. oh, most definitely, most definitely, and okay. brought a lot of people together. Yeah, you know, exactly. Different places and cultures, you know. Yeah. So wonderful. Hey, yeah. um, I want to talk. You know, obviously, you know, with everything that's going on with COVID and whatnot, we've the, the industry has been like basically shut down for nine months, ten months, going on almost a year now. What? You know, obviously, you, we, you all come from touring backgrounds, but you also have studio backgrounds as well. But what have you been doing in the interim to, to keep busy, to keep your sanity, too, of course? I'll start with, I'll start with you, Eva. Uh, to keep my sanity? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, a, a, lot, a lot of that, especially, I mean, I've always had a very, not always, but in the last uh, about 10 years or so, I've had a really strong morning practice. Uh, which doesn't necessarily have to be morning, but like starting out your day with um, a certain routine. And this is something that I talk about on the road as well. It keeps me uh, keeps me sane on the road, keeps me grounded, keeps me in a good place. Uh, so I I've just transferred that over to to being this, this time at home, and that involves um, like journaling, it involves meditation, it in involves some sort of exercise, either yoga or qigong. I've been doing a lot of qigong recently. Mm -hmm. If you know of, of tai chi, it's a tai chi mm -hmm. is a form of qigong. So uh, it's like, you know, just really starting my day with with those kinds of practices has been really imperative to keeping me in inspired and grounded and in a, in a, in a good place or as good as I can be. Um, and to have a good jumping off point. So that's something that's been really helpful to me. Um, and uh, in that, with all that in mind, I've been just really focusing on, a lot of it is perspective, right? And seeing this as an opportunity to do other things. Uh, for me, it's been like higher, continuing education, right? And learning some new things. Also taking advantage of this time to write. I have a new EP that I wrote and recorded. We're about to mix. So just taking this time to really hunker down and um, be creative and also being easy on yourself, right? Like, you know, if maybe if the day goes by and you didn't do a whole lot, <laughs> like weren't, weren't crazy productive because we all like <laughs> feeling like we have a purpose and stuff like yeah, that. Um, right. Just going easy on yourself and just knowing that it's that it's okay. And 
Um, we can we can't control what happens, but we can control how we react to them. So um, just keeping that in mind has been important. Yeah. You know, Eva, um, it's funny. Being easy on yourself has been so important for the last year. That's a phrase that more people should take note of, I think. Uh, it's because I think especially as musicians, we're always looking you need to be somewhat, no matter what level you work on, entrepreneurial. Like back in the day when I was working three sessions a day in the 80s or 90s or even the last decade, or two, now it's the decade prior, but but you were used to being busy. Or when you're on the road, you have sound check and you're planning your day around this. And when you leave for the next gig and getting in and out of the hotel and your life is a whirlwind and it's like that for decades, and then it stopped. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we're sitting around and yeah. where we can't book anything. We can't go to the studio. We can't go on the road. And I think when uh, this started, you were prepping for a tour, weren't you, Eva? Uh, I had just finished a tour. Yeah, you had. Okay. I remember yeah. seeing it around that time. And yeah. I was prepping to tour Canada with James, James Taylor and Bonnie two months, which is now on for this September and October. Hopefully that will be the case. A lot of the medical professionals that we've consulted and a lot of the promoters exactly believe, you know, once the vaccine is in enough people and uh, then things will change fairly rapidly. And of course, we're in an awkward, even more awkward situation. And my friends in New Zealand are gigging. My friends in Australia are gigging. Yeah. You know, the rest of the world is clearing up and we're hitting our peak. Mm -hmm. We have, 4% of the world's population and 25% of the cases and deaths. Right. So, I mean, in this, we're in an exceptional situation in this country. And that's why we think we're going to be able to go to Canada maybe in the fall. And th I'm really glad the tour was booked there as opposed to here. I was talking with Bob Glob the other day, you know, he's, he and Jackson are booked to do some dates with James that Bonnie had declined to do in the U S uh, but that's in April, that's in May, April, June. It's not going to happen, you know, yeah. especially in the U S the rest of the world will be opening up long, far before we do in this country. I think, yeah. although I think within the next year, within the next 10 months, it could easily happen here, you yeah. know, so, but yeah. it's, um, it's an exceptional situation and we need to do exceptional things to overcome it. Yeah. 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 As musicians. Um, so, Eva, we'll come back to your EP here in a second too, because I want to talk a little bit more about that. But I also know Jeff, you have you have a release coming up pretty soon too, correct? Yeah, well, actually, I have one out right now that came out a month ago. It's called Heavy Hitters. It's a project I'm doing. I did with uh, George Lynch, okay, doc and bandmate, uh, yeah. and it's us. It's a covers record. We basically got asked to do um, to do it from Cleopatra Records because we had done a song for a re-release George had done, and they loved what, what it was, which was a cover version. Um, so they asked us to do a whole record of basically hit songs from various decades and us do kind of our thing on it. It came out great, I'm very excited. Like I say, it's called Heavy Hitters. Okay. Um, that's out. Uh, and then we have the our second End Machine record. End Machine is a project I also have with George Lynch and originally was also with Mick Brown, who was the drummer in Dokken. So it was three of us from Dokken and Robert nice. Mason singer from Warrant. We put out a record a couple years ago. We're now putting out the second one. It's all finished and done in the can. So I did. I was able to do two records, a lot of it remotely during the pandemic, which was great. Kept me sane. Um, and uh, the End Machine record comes out April 9th, but I think the first single is going to be end of February. So looking forward to that. And, um, and uh, yeah, just trying to keep as busy as possible. But you've been you've also been producing other bands too, if I'm not mistaken. Did you did the last Last in Line album too? I did well, I've done both Last in Line records, which is for those who don't know, it's it was the uh it's the group of the ex Dio members. So it was originally Jimmy Bain, Vinny Apice, and Vivian Campbell with uh Andrew uh the singer is Andrew um Oh my God, I'm spacing his last name right now. Holy oh, crap. Yeah, my mind is damaged. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so they did, they've done two records. I produced both of those. Uh, Jimmy, of course, passed away in mm -hmm. 2015. So Phil Susan is now the bass player. But yeah, I produced those oh. two records. I produced a Warren record. I produced an Adler record. I mean, not all in the pandemic, but yeah. Right. Um, 
so yeah, producing is actually a big passion of mine and something I like to do and I have been able to do during the pandemic, which is great. Um, like Ava, I also you know have a morning ritual and a yoga meditation routine, which has kept me very sane. I've also been teaching uh, a meditation class on Monday, oh, yeah. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, which has been really cool. Um, it's all virtual. Uh, and it's, uh, if you go to yoga at hot for yoga, um, you can sign up for the virtual classes. There's also yoga classes. There's also Pilates classes available virtually. So it's a really nice little virtual package if you're into that too. I'm so, awesome. it is, that down, it's into meditation, but, uh, it is, I, I like Ava, I find, or, and, and Hutch too. I find that this is a time to kind of take a pause, kind of reflect on your life, do a little mm -hmm. inner work. It's a great time for that, and and you're right. If if that's all you accomplish in a day, that's okay. I do love staying busy, but I'm learning to kind of relax a little more, and I like that. Yeah, yeah. Dina, yeah. we have the most woke artists, I guess. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> not worthy. I'm, yeah. I am just. I'm proud of everyone. That's all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, John, John, another thing, up. Let's, thing that we're here yeah. for Ampeg, another thing I've found that I'm, I'm really enjoying here is like experimenting and checking out new pieces of gear that someone will come by or someone will send. And um, that's, it's, it's a lot, even a lot of stuff on my pedal board when I play live. I'm not familiar. I mean, I just start throwing knobs around and, and this actually gets, gives me a chance like your uh, SCRDI, which I love yes. using yes. in my yes. interface here. Um, I know a couple of these other DA. Yeah, there you go. I live by this thing now, you know. And, I, and the old tube DIs, you know, I'm I'm a big fan of those. And I, I'm not sure if that's ever coming back. But uh, I've been encouraging you guys to to go to. Wouldn't that be great? To, to do a redo of those tube DIs. I have two. <laughs> One was stolen out of my truck. I. I realized I left one at a friend's studio and I was there in November doing an upright track. And he says, Hey, why don't we use your Ampeg tube DI? And I said, well, it's not here. It's in my, my studio gear. And they said, Johnny Lee shell goes, no man, I got one right here. You left this thing here about 10 years ago. And I went, <laughs> Oh, I have another one. This is perfect. You know, I'll just leave it here so it doesn't get stolen. Or again. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, but it's great being able to sit here and have the time to actually be able to go through different effects and you know which she gave me a number of things and uh, and uh, these uh, other DIs and combinations of gear. It's a good way to occupy your time and and being more familiar with your gear never hurts. So, so right. So, and speaking, speaking of gear, what's everybody's wish list? Like what, what's what what are some of the things you want to see Ampeg come out with in the next? I don't know, couple. Couple of years, and, and anybody that's watching. So we have comment. Just so you guys know, we have comments coming in too. Oh, um, where are the comments? I haven't seen the comments. I'm full screen. That's why I must yeah. exit my full screen. Yeah. No, oh, there I'm they right are. I got right that. Screen. So oh my people, god, there's too many yeah, comments. No, people are just kind of chiming in. Obviously, we actually had uh, a, a good friend of ours. You guys will all know uh, Paul Audi had comments yes. that to yeah. say as well. So. But uh, yeah, for those of you that are watching, type your comments in and let us know what you would like to see from Ampeg as well. And I'll give you Dominic's uh, personal cell phone number and his email yeah. address too. Twenty four seven. Just so, hit me up. <laughs> but no, anyway, so you guys, you guys what, do you, like to, what do you like to see? I would like to see another tube di and okay. uh, and maybe some type of plugin or something that would be a universal. Something we could do with a uh, with a DAW somehow, you know. I mean, uh, that would reflect. I mean, there are plenty of people who've modeled Ampeg amps out there and done it, but it'd be nice for uh, done it fairly well. But it'd be nice for you guys to do it. Yeah, cool. agreed. Are any of you guys? Are any you guys using plugins right now in your, sure. in your studios? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Using yeah. both and the you, Universal I, Audio. I, I definitely use the Universal Audio SVT and the B15 sometimes. Okay, uh, they're good. Um, yeah. but boy, if Ampeg could do one, I, I agree with Hutch. It'd be awesome. Okay. All right. Cool. And John, Neva, you guys, you're using, pl using Ampeg plugins, obviously, or? I use, I, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, go ahead, go ahead John. It. Oh, fine. Uh, I use the UA plugin all the time. Um, yep. but I also used, uh, so the last tours that we were doing, that I was doing with the who were with full orchestra. Yeah. 
Um, so my SVT was not allowed uh, three feet. <laughs> oh, of course. Section, if you know what I mean. Um, so I was actually using the Line 6, uh, the Helix, with an SVT plug-in. Um, and I used that for the that whole, I forget how long we were out doing that, but it was quite a while. It sounded great. People, yeah. You know, seemed to, I, it sounded great in my ears. People seemed to think it sounded great, great out front. So. Nice. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. John, we did, uh, Foreigner did a lot of, has done a lot of orchestral shows in the last couple of years, and my SVT, too, also was banned from this, <laughs> <laughs> or, or even from underneath it in some venues. Um, but what I ended up doing, I ended up getting a Kemper, which I was never going to do, but I have a beautiful 71 SVT that is, it's my favorite SVT in the world, uh, and I actually sampled it. Mm -hmm. I was amazed. It worked beautifully, and I was quite mm -hmm. happy. So. Um, I know if Ampeg went to the effort to really, really dial it in, they could come up with something that would beat them all, and I'd love that. That's cool. Beat them all. That's my you know, motto right now. You yeah. guys need to like black out my screen so you can't see my reactions. <laughs> <laughs> you can neither confirm nor deny anything. Right. right. Are, are you nervous? <laughs> <laughs> Dawn's always nervous when we start talking about new gear. <laughs> yeah. You should be excited. Come on. Oh, I'm always excited. There you it's, go. It's when my yeah, it's it's I'm always, I need to like chill my excitement when I go to corporate. That's all. Uh, yeah, you know, middleman thing. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. I was I was I was actually doing I was doing an interview yesterday with one of our backline companies, Atlanta Backline, um, and and one of their guys had asked me. They said, "So, you know what what's new coming coming from Ampeg?" I was like, "If I told you, I'd have to kill you." I, 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 for the first time in 17 years, I've worked with the brand. It's like, I, there's so much like there's cool stuff coming out and it, and it's it, that Dom and I talk about and plan and, but we can't talk about it. So and we're going to keep you hanging on yourself. Right? Exactly. Exactly. But uh, it's more like if I told you I would, it would kill you. Cause it's yeah, bad. that's true too. Yeah. Well, what <laughs> I believe awesome. is that all the force of the four of us just getting on you about a new plugin. I can <laughs> someday, someday <laughs> happen. I believe that in my heart. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. When you guys play out now and play do gigs, larger shows, um, even, you know, theater type of shows, two, three, 4,000 seats uh, or stadiums or arenas, how much of an amp sound do you use at this point? I've seen that this is SVTT time. Um, yeah. Because in ears have become pr prominent in our business, and then and it really depends sometimes on the genre of music you're you're performing. Right. So I, I'm just curious if you if you still have amps on stage, do you still have amps on stage or like? Off stage. Uh, Off when, stage Both. Okay, and when we because when we went. There was a transition a few years ago with us, with Bonnie and James and doing, especially doing arenas to in-ears. So I went to a number of bassist friends. I went to Daryl Jones, I went to Pino, you know, their respective situations. Pino was still with The Who at that time, um, you know, and I'd see my friends perform and they'd still have a lot of the times SVTs on stage, but our Ampex, which Daryl does and, and you know, the, the musicians in the Stones are sort of anti-in-ear. You know, they're, they have wedges below the floor all, everywhere. Yeah. With Bonnie, it was overnight. Our drummer started using them, and the, his wedges sort of went, th we all have wedges in case of emergency. But I was like Lee Sklar, who was with Phil Collins, was one of the only one out of 14 musicians on stage with no in-ears, a, a, a rig, and, and a wedge. I sort of took that route for a while until more things kept disappearing from the stage. And I felt really sort of naked and alone up there, you know, and uh, now I'm using in-ears, but I'm also using the amp. I need to feel something behind me. And I was yep. just curious as to what you guys were doing as far as that goes. How much of an amp sound do you have on stage? And if, and I know Jeff, you just said you're off, off stage, which is where Bonnie's amps are yep. now. And, and yeah, and, you know, and much to the chagrin of all the management people that are backstage, I I still have my <laughs> I tend that they bitch about nightly, but um, but uh, yeah, so I've got the SVT off stage. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on me to go Kemper full time, um, 
I'm trying to resist as long as I can. Um, yeah. yeah. Of my SVT. I, I do feel a little bit of it off stage if it's not too far away. Yeah. But yeah. Generally we have a wonderful monitor guy who right. uh, is really good so at, at giving me the feeling of air. Uh, right. In the air. right. Uh, and so, also in my in-ears, I'm, insistent upon having a lot of room sound and a lot yeah. of house. So I yeah. don't lose that feel of playing in a big room. And yeah. and also that I'm able so I'm able to hear the crowd. I mean it's which is a big yeah. part that response that we get when we do play is such a big right. part of what we do, I believe. You know? Yeah. And bass itself is it's so visceral. You you just I don't yeah, I don't know how I can't ever just go in here. I was in mid tour once and my bass uh, rig just disappeared from stage. Nobody gave me a heads up, and I was literally showing up to sound check. And I was like, oh, oh, that's "Okay, tough. here we go." Yeah, here <laughs> yeah. we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, a, lo a, lo a lot of the gigs that I've done, I'm we're at the mercy of the show creator, and right, a lot right. of time, most right. musicians yeah. don't have the choice. Uh, when we do festivals and stuff, all we're lucky we get all of our amps because it's like festival vibes, right. and oh, rock see, and roll right. band vibes. But on a lot of on a lot of these gigs, when it's a clean stage and there's a lot of, um, you know, lights, camera, action, dancers, uh, aerialist stuff like that, the way that our wonderful monitor guys uh, remedy not feeling the bass in, in conjunction with the in-ears is uh, butt kickers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I'm going to ask. Yeah, right. you, you so we're feeling it. Yeah. The butt kicker thing didn't really work for me. Um, really? You know, our drummer lives by it. Funny thing, another funny thing is when it was working for me, being the only person with an amp and a wedge still, and you know my level wasn't loud enough so that the front of house engineer it really disturbed him last that much. I mean, there's a certain amount of stuff coming off stage anyway, and I yeah. think he felt having the bass sound a little more warmer, being you know unidirectional, coming off the stage was even better for some people in the front rows of the mm -hmm. house. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, but still, it can't be loud enough to be offensive. And it's funny, I asked Tony Levin, was on, who's a dear friend, who's also from Boston, uh, um, about the same thing. And he sort of laughed. And because in-ears are such an integral part of what he's done with Peter, with Peter Gabriel for so long, and with King Crimson, he said, well, Hutch, King Crimson has three drummers. If I didn't wear in-ears, I wouldn't know where one was up there. Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> and, 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 um, and he said, with Peter, I mean, sometimes he's hanging on straps flying through the air from the ceiling. So it's like, you know, it's having an, having an amp and not having in-ears isn't even practical yeah. in those gigs. No. So and I was that, wondering with you in pink, I don't know if you did any aerial acrobatics or whatever. Me or personally? Which, yeah. <laughs> I, I keep putting it in the suggestion box and like, oh, <laughs> nothing. I will, I will put that Crickets. in the suggestion box. <laughs> yeah. Eva, oh. where, where did you have your butt kickers? Were they like on a, their own platform below So you they are, will be drilled to the stage. Or okay. on if I, or in some case, like on the share tour, I was on a uh, platform. Say they so um, a riser. Say they would just drill it into the right. riser. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, depending on the setup, um, they usually just drill them right into the stage. But did you yeah. have to stand in certain parts of the stage to be able to feel them, or was it kind of like just omnipresent all over the stage? Well, so it caught on, and, and everyone ended up on. loving. I'm like, oh my god, this is awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> so they were drilled. Started drilling them all at like the the drummer had you know had them, and um, so they started drilling them. Kind of yeah. all over the stage yeah and uh yeah i mean that's really it it's really been been great when we don't have the luxury of an amp yeah yeah i was yeah. gonna say as time moves forward in those and maybe that trend continues or heightens a little bit more with having less footprint for an amp or less uh stage volume with an amp i guess what is um i guess some uh desired form factors of that like was the platform enough would you rather have something that's kind of like on you physically, but not really seen or? So I've heard about the, I don't know who it is, but someone's making um, a, s a similar device that's on a strap. Yeah. So that's physically oh. on you. So if you are oh. strapped, if you, if you're, if you're a uh, wireless, you know, when you're running around stage or whatever, oh, it goes with you. So that's. I've actually tried those. Oh. You have. They're, and they're pretty great. Uh, a little bulky, like a little yeah. heavy. If you're, yeah. So is I, don't it a you, I don't know if you could do your aerobatics with that, you know, but. <laughs> Is it, it a is it a speaker and the little speaker in the strap or it's just it's a transducer that vibrates? Yeah. yeah, okay. It's called, back beat. it's called a what? A back beat. Oh, back okay. Beat. Yeah, it would beat your back, oh, wouldn't you, it? Yeah, back yeah, and you put it the again, the problem 
that you run into with something like that, though, it, especially if you're on a big production, now you've got your wireless pack for your bass, you've got mm. your wireless pack for your in-ears, and now you've got another wireless pack that you're strapping onto your strap. You're going to eventually you're going to look like Batman. You know, <laughs> the pack sure. And I that's know. a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the problem is, <laughs> where's my bass? I'm more of an Iron Man type of guy, but okay. <laughs> Where are you going after the gig? I'm going to storm the Capitol. What do you think? I mean, oh, you <laughs> hey, look I just, like a. Uh, <laughs> I just want to address one question here uh, from uh, from Nor Norman Sawyer, who's. I'd like to see Ampeg re-release the V4B. I've owned two through my career and always oh. wondered why they dropped that. So I just want to point this out. Norman, we do have, it's called, it is a V4B. Uh, go to ampeg.com under the classic section and there is a hundred watt V4B there that is a dead knockoff of, of like a early seventies, mid seventies uh, V4. It's I one of my, that amp. it's my, it's that my amp. personal yeah. favorite amp. Really? Really? Myself as well. Bob Bob uses it religiously with Jackson yep. and, I mean, it's oh, it's cool. uh, one of my favorites for sure. It's a hundred watt SVT, basically. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a manageable SVT. Hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> man, I like the way you phrase that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, other than these guys back here in, in the background, so um, you just you know, let's face it. I, I mean, I, I will always haul an SVT or hire somebody to haul an SVT for me whenever whenever it's feasible. Uh, most most of the rooms that I'm playing aren't aren't you know don't warrant having an SVT. But Hutch brought up a great question. You know, like like he was saying, when you get to a certain size stage, how much of that is actually the amp that's filling the stage? And now, of course, with in ears, you know, a lot of that, you know, that that feeling again. There's the visual aspect. You know, we all know that there, there's a lot of acts that put what we call dummy rigs on stage when when they can do that. You know, just basically unloaded cabinets, unloaded heads, just for the visual aspect of it. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a question that we are, as an amp manufacturer, faced with every day. The relevance of building these big SVTs and these all-tube amps. And I will say this to the day I died. Nothing, in my opinion, will ever sound like an SVT. It's, just, it's what we've grown up with, you know, or a B-15. Right. But the reality of touring and the and the financial aspect of touring and the physical aspect of touring, you know, and you know, at some point the world might run out of tubes. You know, I'm not saying it it'll happen in my lifetime or any, but at some point people are going to stop manufacturing tubes because it's just a losing proposition. You know, that's what they said about magnetic tape, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and look where we are. <laughs> and then you came back. So there you go. I know. Oh, camera cool. film. Yeah. Double your comment though, because yeah, exactly. playing meditation and then playing through an SVT, they're like like the same outcome on either end, but just like a little different way to get there. But yesterday I did some R and D at the facilities, and uh, yeah, it was just so nice to crank through an SVT again. It is therapeutic. It is definitely yeah. therapeutic. No yeah. question about it. In it. Back back in the um, well, in St. Louis, back in the day, you know, I was using uh, Steve Robbie from SWR. It made me these eight by eights, which now, um, uh, John McVie owns, but, mm -hmm. uh, MPEG saw them at a show and, uh, there was a tech there in Chicago. He had really long hair. He looked like a, I mean, in St. Louis looked like a surfer. He was like their, their main amp guy back then. And, uh, he restored a couple of old B-15s and B-18, some of the off weird models I had. And, uh, but then he saw these cabs at a gig and all of a sudden I showed up in another gig and there were two Ampeg 8x8s, which I think Daryl Jones now has a few of as well after he cool. saw yeah. me using them. He asked about them, and I directed them towards you guys. But I, I was using – back in the 90s, I was using two two 8x8s and then two 4x10s on top of that with two SVT heads. Now, over the years, that's been, of course, as relating to what we were just talking about, Bonnie and go, do you really need those two <laughs> four by tens up there? Our production manager, who's a bassist as well, Derek, he, um, Derek Williams, he would um, he go, well, maybe we can just get rid of half of it or something. You know, it was really humongous. And um, and it's funny, now I'm down to one eight by eight. So over the years, it's transitioned into this. 
but I, I just can't relinquish it. I need something behind me yeah. unless it was going to be something orchestral like John was talking about, you know, uh, I just really need something physical there. It's, it's, uh, and luckily enough with Bonnie, it's, she's really a rock artist and people who've seen her live who only knew her from her sort of pop ballads and they yeah. see her live, they're sort of blown away because she plays loud. I mean, that, yeah, yeah. that was one of the good things about in-ears. The people who were the worst offenders were all of a sudden 50 feet away from me. So yeah. it was like, oh, I can hear Ricky playing. Right. Uh, the funny thing about our drummer was he used to, when he w went, before, prior to using in-ears, he was very quiet in his touch. I mean, you could barely sometimes hear him live. As soon as he put the in-ears on, he's like, bam, 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 because he can control the volume level. So now in his ears, he's quiet, but he's hitting the drums a lot harder. And drummers have brought this up to me as well. So yeah. all of a sudden I'm without any ears and he's bah, 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 like banging me. Yeah, I know. It's funny. You it's usually the opposite. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's the opposite too. You think, right? Because <laughs> they can hear the dynamics better, but yeah. 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 So now, yeah. before, yeah, now he's hitting a lot louder because I think he can bring himself down in his in his uh, before his before he was he was always known for his soft touch. You yeah. know, very precise. Was he cranking his side fills or something before. What's that? Was he cranking his side fills and that's how he would play so quiet and get away with it? I believe so. Yeah, and he was primarily a studio drummer. He was on those great Beach Boys records of the early '70s. He was he and Blondie Chaplin were members. Sail on Sailor and all those records. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, Carl and the Passions and Hey Marcella. Um, so I mean, he, and you know, he's he's worked in the studio a lot over the years. So I think he was. Right. He was more aligned towards that than live performance. Yeah. Whereas yeah. with my background, I mean, it was a bit of more of both, I think. So, yeah. but it's funny how in ears can change the way someone plays, and that's what Leland said to me. He said, "Man, you know, I want to wear headphones. I'll make a record." But he said, "I want to do a gig. I want to hear my amp." You know, yeah. and and so he's still a holdout. He will not. He refuses to wear in ears, no matter who he's playing with. But yeah. he's Leland, and he can get away with that. So, right, right, right. <laughs> Hey, Eva, uh, I know I said we come back. Tell us about your EP real quick. Sure, oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, gosh, yeah, I mean. I caught you off guard. I'm sorry. No, no worries. I'm just I'm just like, you know, with uh, what I was saying, I'm like um, learning a new skill, right? So I started taking like music production courses and all that stuff oh, and, and literally was able to like write and record most of it on my own, uh, on my own rig. And um, I'm using like 80% of my stems and redid drums because I programmed all the demos. So retract live drums, redid the vocals um, at, you know, with better gear at a different place. And I've got six song EP coming up. Nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Should you play drums? I don't play drums, but I'm good at, I'm good at keep, I mean, I can keep a beat on drums. Yeah. If I yeah. wasn't a bass yeah. player, I would be a drummer. Uh, oh, I, do enjoy the I wanted to be a drum. I wanted to be a drummer, but my mother didn't feel they were musical enough. So it was off to the cello, and then, then the uh. bass mandolin, and, <laughs> and I, then I saw Wilson Pickett when I was twelve years old. I think I uh, Billy Cox was playing bass, and I believe oh, Henry was the guitar him. player at that time. Wow, nineteen sixty-five, and it was a matinee performance uh, at a place Dino might know. It was called the Surf Ballroom. It was in uh, south of Boston in Nant Nantasket. And uh, I was right on the stage. Literally, I was right in front of Billy Cox. Huge, awesome Memphis, Nashville band. And I was like, I went home to my mom. It was like, I need a, I need yep. a Fender bass. I, I love Billy sort of, playing. Yeah. yeah he's, uh, he's one of my favorites. And he's sort of a sung hero, actually, yeah. to a lot of people, I think. Yeah, and, yeah uh, absolutely. Yeah, far more influ influential than most people give him credit for. Yes. And, uh. Yeah, anyway, I, I, a couple of months after that, I saw Howlin' Wolf, and uh, his bassist was using a, an Impeg EBO. And, oh. uh, and, Gibson? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Gibson EBO. Yeah. And, and, uh, and a B-15. So mm -hmm. I, that was my first B-15. I said to my mm -hmm. mom, I had a Fender Bassman, and we traded it in for a, for a B-15. And uh, I got an EBO, actually, in 66, which my mom bought me. And um, I still have it today. It's that was the first great. bass I ever played. Andy Johns let me his EBO. Oh, my, yeah. dad would, my dad would let me touching his stuff. So Andy well, let I'm, me his, 
his I, EBR. I'm big, on, I'm big on short scale bases. I really, really yeah. like. Them. I love That's them. Cool. Yeah. But then Andy's and I gave it back to Andy, and then he stepped on it and broke it, <laughs> and then tried to blame it on me. <laughs> you, I'm you like, I'm like 14. Oh, sorry, 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 Ava. I'm Andy, I can see that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, Andy. The Chambers Brothers, the, the group, the Chambers Brothers, they had that. Yeah, game. dear friends. I, I actually have Pops Chambers EB3 that he you played. You do? I do. It's my it's, God. I play with Lester wow. all the time. I've worked with him. Wow. With um, my friend Roger McNamee. We he. He and Lester and his son, one of the other brothers. I played on last Lester's last few records, and uh, wow! And those wow. guys are. When I was a kid in Boston, they lived in a town called Arlington, which was adjacent to Cambridge, where I grew up. Oh, and uh, I met them when I was twelve or thirteen years old. Once again, that was a big time for me in music. And uh, it was the mid '60s, and there was a lot going on. There were a lot of English bands around, and that was sort of a, a hub. And yeah. um, and so, uh, but Lester's still a friend. I played with him at Bottle Rock uh, up in Napa uh, a couple of years ago with Roger and, and Moon Alice. And it was quite, and any time to this day, it's funny how the song Time has transitioned through generations because mm -hmm. this is a young hipster, you know, wine and cheese rock festival crowd. <laughs> and, yeah. and they were, as soon as those first, Ding, 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 ding. Everybody's like, whoa, we know this. You know, yeah. it's, it's just one of those rock anthems. It's like Bob yeah. O'Reilly or something. As yeah. soon as people hear that intro, they, they know what's coming next and they're always ready for it. So I'm glad most of those guys are still with us. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. and that's amazing you have that bass. Well, I've, I've seen that bass in action many times. That's wow. So wow. cool. It's an early '69 EB3. Very cool. I've got to I've got to come out and see it when I'm back in LA. Please do. You're welcome <laughs> anytime. All of you are. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Hey, John, you got to show us your Rickenbacker. Okay, let me go grab oh, it. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, before we go, we got to see this because there was somebody on the side there that was asking to see it as well. Oh. Okay, while he's gone, let's talk. No, I'm just. It's one pickup. Yeah. yeah it's it's one one model. Model. Four thousand, not a four thousand. I think it so was cheaper than a four thousand one because you know. I've yeah, never yeah. seen uh, that. No binding. Wow! Wow! wow. Oh, fantastic! Oh, Beautiful. One more time um, on the front. Yeah. Yeah, really. Jeff and I got to awesome. put our specs on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that's great, John. Wow! Cool. Yeah, so they ship it, on it, which sounds they ship it to Alaska, right? <laughs> What's that? They shipped those to Alaska. That's why I never saw it in, in New England, right? Yeah, all of them. All of the 4,000s went to Alaska. They're like, ah, oh, just get those. <laughs> they don't need the second pickup up there. Exactly. What do they know? <laughs> do, you, uh, do, you, do you use that on the road, or is that, is, does that stay home with you? Do you use that on the road, or does that stay home with you? Um, I use this with uh, Cheryl Crow, actually. For a okay. Oh, nice. Um, but, uh, yeah, I haven't brought it out. In years, I don't use it with the Who. The Who, I use a P bass. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 So. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for showing that. That that is beautiful. I've always been a fan of Ricks, but I just I can't get around to playing them. They just feel. I mean, I got big big hands and big sausage fingers, so a Rick to me feels like feels very small and. Cool and though. They, I, you know, with any different instrument, it makes you play different. Like they, like you said, they're so different. I'm like very different on them. I love using it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point too. I mean, I have way too many bases at this point in my life. And, but that, no, such thing. Think, no such thing. But that was, I think, one of the reasons I, I acquired them all is because I'd be doing different dates. You know, I, I, the I did a couple of Ringo records, and the first one I did not have a Hofner. I had a Rickenbacker, you know, but. Uh, I needed. I felt I needed a Hofner. The song "Way to the World." I I used a um, uh -huh. a, a telly bass, and and but I you know I I ended up with now a number of Hofners. Uh, <laughs> the one I bought in Hamburg, oh, you know, that a beautiful cool. club bass. But I felt for the sound, the way he played drums, I wanted to have that bass. I mean, wow. it was an integral part of the sound and. He was still using the same kit of drums from 65, so I figured Ooh. I needed a bass that equated nice. it. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Those are all gorgeous. Yeah. Is that, is that, 
T Bird, all original parts, even has the mute, the felt mutes, which I've never seen before. Oh, nice, nice, nice. That's the one that's in your promo shot now, Jeff, isn't it? The one that we used for this. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. That's cool. I, yeah. yeah. Love that bass. Nice, nice. So, man, we're we're like we're right at knocking at an hour and five minutes, and okay. uh, I just I just texted our producer to see if we're okay, and uh, okay, yeah, I guess we're okay. So, all right. Uh, but listen, again, I all right. Sounds uh, like Nam now. I was gonna say now. <laughs> can, can, can you do some more slapping and eat? <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, listen, guy. I, I again, I cannot thank you guys for your enough for your time. This has been. It's always, always awesome to talk to you guys. I wish we were doing it in person. Um, I guess you know, it, it, in lieu of doing it in person, this is the next best thing until uh, until we can meet again or meet in person. Um, I'm just going to check our private or our comments over here. If anybody has any like parting comments, but, um, yeah, do you, like I said, do you guys have any parting comments or things that you want to, you want to plug or say, or before we cut loose here? Um, we should do this again. Yep. And, uh, Great. this is a good panel. I, everybody's great and it's been illustrative and fun. And, um, and uh, I have a new bass coming out, a Lakeland Hutch Hutchinson short scale, awesome. which is very nice. Oh, yeah. And, uh, which I helped design. Do you have a prototype there Allen. we can see? What's that? You is there a prototype you? there that you, we can see? That's what I, I was actually playing. I was sort of, I'm sort of beta sure. testing it as we speak. Ooh, oh, nice. Nice. Short scale. Um, nice. Plays great and lots of fun. Love the color. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it's a great. burgundy mist. And um, anyways, and uh, then I've been producing a couple of artists, a UK artist, uh, Holly Lursky, and working with uh, Knopfler with uh, David and Mark, who are founders of Dire Straits, and um, and staying busy here on Maui. I mean, we're getting ready to do a new Bonnie record, so I think we're going to find a studio where we can sort of sequester ourselves in a, a residential right. studio somewhere, maybe in Northern California, which I which will remain unnamed, but we've actually already figured it out so um yeah and then hopefully we'll all be on the road later in the year yep. yeah yep. yeah we'll see yeah exactly hopefully we'll see you all on the road and you know um oh yeah one more thing playing for change uh there's an organization i work with named playing for change we did a video with robbie robertson and ringo last year called the wait and they build schools around the world uh creative arts schools and from Africa to Appalachia to Asia, wherever. And um, we've got a few more videos coming out shortly. We just did uh, we just did one with a bunch of friends here with Michael McDonald and Pat Simmons and some other folks and Keb Mo. And uh, anyway, there'll, there'll be a lot of releases this year. They're a really worthy organization. So if anybody goes for playing for change to playingforchange.com, you can check out the videos and okay. make some purchases of rare world music instruments and um anyway it's an interesting organization and people should be um, more aware of it i think the wave video got a lot of a lot of play and recognition during the pandemic okay uh, okay yeah and, and they and you brought up a very good point here that i that we kind of skimmed over but if it wasn't for music in our schools like i think we all got our start music in schools and coming up yeah. from the school program and I mean, yeah. none of us would be here today. So the more you Not can do all. for your local music programs and your school programs, by all means, please do because it's it needs it. It needs it, especially at this in these times. Um, One thing I'd like to plug, if it's okay, is so, uh, we're trying to help our crew because the crew, you know, through yeah. no fault of yeah. their own, they're out of work for a year. Yep. Um, yeah. So if you go to foreigneronline.com and go to the store that's there. We're offering a bunch of like bundles with vintage nice. t-shirts and all sorts of other stuff. We're auditioning, I mean, we're auctioning off a guitar, which I will grab for you right now from Breed Love. It's a beautiful little small concert uh, acoustic that sounds great. We're gonna auction that off, um, sign it to the um, to the winner. And uh, 
And all the proceeds are going to go to the crew who really need it. So we know a lot of people are having a hard time. But if you're able, we would so appreciate it. It's a great cause. Foreigneronline.com and go to the store. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for bringing that up, Jeff, because that is that that's an awesome point. With you know, it's not yeah. just musicians that are out of work through all yeah. this. It's, it's I mean, it affects so it's many. Our, so many and it's our entire industry, and that's what people don't yeah. get. It's engineers Ooh. and runners and second engineers and riggers and everybody yeah. who we work with on a daily basis, whether it's in the studio or in a live performance situation. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, I, I think the general public, they're somewhat aware of it, but they don't really truly understand how much our industry has been devastated by this pandemic yeah. you know, mm -hmm. internationally. I yeah. mean, because once touring stopped, it stopped on an international level. And right. uh, until things are somewhat resolved medically, we'll, we weren't going to be up and running for, for a couple of years, I think. I've, although, as I said, I believe that we may be touring Canada later in the year, but you know, in the, domestically in the US and even in Europe right now, Things have not been handled well, and uh, right. in, in the UK and in in the US, we're really sort of in trouble here. I think we have we probably have another year of this before yeah. things start to feel somewhat normal. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, you know, any anything that anybody can do to help, you know, that that's. I'm glad you guys brought this up because this this is a perfect forum to to reach out and 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 get help to the people that need help as well. So. Thank well, I think that. some of us too, I think, you know, we have residuals or we have some type of payment coming in from something we've sure. done in the past. Crew guys have, don't have that. I mean, right. and e even, yeah. I hate to, I hate to say it, but even agents who I'm not a fan of agents sometimes, <laughs> but it's like, you know, and uh, management all down the line. I mean, it's like, right. it's, it's so all encompassing as yeah. far as our business goes. Yeah. yeah. And there are a lot of people having a really difficult time. So yeah. Hope they all do well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, everyone, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for joining. Uh, everybody watching in. Thanks for joining. Like I, like I was telling Dom at the very beginning, this is our 10th episode of SVT time and hopefully, you know, the 10th of many more. Yes. We'd love to have you all back on at some point. Um, you know, so uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank everybody for watching in. Uh, on behalf of myself and Ampeg and Dom, everybody play more bass, stay healthy, and we'll see you out on the road. Thank cool. you. Yeah. Thanks, thank everyone. You guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to try to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on Hawaii time. So. <laughs> see you guys. Love Bye. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Aloha. Aloha.